Right, everybody, uh, good afternoon and welcome to this month's Secrets Revealed, Blood, Sweat and Tears, Gloucestershire's uh, Jobs in the Past. Um, as usual, it's going to be delivered by John Putley, um, who is Community Heritage Officer here at Gloucestershire Archives, and he's worked here for many, many years. Um, uh, before we start the talk, just a few important things to mention. Um, first of all, we are recording this session, so if you'd rather not be seen, now's a good time to turn off your camera. Um, secondly, if you wouldn't mind um, popping yourself on mute just so we can get rid of some of that background noise that would be fantastic thank you very much um, and um, finally if you have any questions as we go along um, if I could ask you to pop them into the chat uh, facility and then at the end we'll um, when John has finished the talk we'll we'll stop and we'll answer some of those questions um, so without further ado I'd like to pass over to John Pat Putley thank you very much John Okay, Jen, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming in today. Um, it's a, this job, this is all about Gloucestershire jobs in the past. There are so many, obviously, it's a sort of real eclectic mix here. Um, and I, I do have to warn you that sort of about five days ago, the laptop I was working on completely died. So I have to, this has been a real rush job at the end. And I literally only stopped, well, I only finished it, I hope, about 20 minutes ago. So I apologise now in advance for any typos or slides that to go off the edge or anything like that. But we'll, we'll get started and we'll see how we go. So um, start off. I'm going to do it A to Z. I did look at it doing it and themes, but it's much easier this way. So we'll have a look at Ag Labs, Agricultural Labour Organisation, basically. Um, until fairly recently, they were easily the most numerous occupation in the in the county. Um, and, you know, like most farmers still do today, they work long hours, they had little pay, but they often got rewards in the form of drink provided by the employers. Um, and you know, William Marshall, who was writing in 1700, said Gloucestershire was one of the worst places in the country for actually paying their labourers in drink. Um, <clears throat> this example, lovely picture of haymaking on the Chase Farm, Charingworth, around about 1920. So you can see, even at that late date, you know, tractors, you know, not really around. Haymaking was still quite for, uh, something that everybody did. So you can see by the kids here as well. Um, most farmhands started work when they were about seven or eight years old, sometimes earlier. They were often bird scaring or stone picking or weeding. And they sort of, as time passed, they progressed onto the more skilled jobs as they grew older. Um, they had to be versatile, usually had to be very familiar with working animals. And this is a lovely photograph of their cultivator driver and a farm boy. They're harrowing with a team of oxen in the Bathurst State in Sirencester. And despite the oxen, this was actually taken around 1920. So, you know, we tend to forget that oxen, you know, we tend to think of them been medieval beasts but they were used really well into the 1920s and even into the 1930s in some places moving on uh, again with a and cultural machinery contractors uh, a couple of lovely photographs here the one at the top shows james blackwell's a thresher and a chaff, a chaff cutter being towed by a traction engine and the bottom one is ws browning the son of stonehouses they're working a marshall threshing machine um, now, this was the most common sort of thing you did with contractors, um, and they didn't really start to appear to the 1830s when threshing machines can become a size where they could be fairly easily moved and they could be horse drawn from farm to farm. Of course, as time passed on, they were basically replaced by steam power, sometimes in the form of what they call portable engines, where you'd move the steam engine to it, set it up, and then later on as traction engines, as you can see here. Um, and it became more and more popular until today. Actual agricultural contracting is a huge business, and many farms you see today they actually don't have the machinery to do their own crops. They're having contractors. Um, it's much easier and works out cheaper in the long run for them. Moving on to bee beekeepers. Um, Often thought of the realm of country vicars than retired, but you know this photograph is an interesting one. It's from the show students of the Gloucestershire Cookery School with some hives. Um, now we've got bees at the archives. We've got still three, three currently three hives. Um, one swarmed yesterday, which we're able to catch. Um, and we are, we love this photograph, but I mean we are really quite concerned. The lack of gloves here. Um, they've got veils on, which is fine, but they've got no gloves on, uh, and the dresses are all of open sleeves. So you know you can imagine where these bees could get to and as someone speaking from experience i've had a bee fly me well down me well and up my trouser i know i think these people are very very brave 
Uh, blacksmiths, most villages had a blacksmith working for them, repairing ironwork or for working as farriers. And these two nice photos, the top one um, shows that the Cam um, blacksmith, Absalom Ford, which is a wonderful name. He's shoeing a horse in his forge in Chapel Street around about 1910. And the bottom one is, is the uh, blacksmith, Bill Cleeton, who's shoeing a horse near Clifford's Main near New Newen, around about 1900. Um, Interestingly, as just relation, the number of motor vehicles increased, blacksmithing virtually died out, but a few remained as farriers going from farm to farm, and some smiths actually transitioned into being the sort of the first automobile mechanics. So, you know, they, although they did virtually die out, some did keep going. And today, luckily, blacksmith has undergone a real resurgence and lots of new smiths are becoming specialist artisans and artists who are just as skilled as the blacksmiths in the past. But they also use new techniques, new ideas. Um, one great out outlay for output for them is in reenaction, where very often you'll get blacksmiths specialised in making reenactment tools and reenactment fires for sort of the, the wealth of reenactors out there. And I should know, I've got a guy I use who actually works in Western Supermare, Anvil Art. I use a lot of his stuff. Um, so these people are really good and it's great to see them around again now. One slide about brewing. Obviously, Gloucester had numerous breweries, some small, some large. And this is a lovely picture of the Cheltenham Original Brewery Company's new brewery in Cheltenham, which it said new brewery because the old one got burnt down. And so they rebuilt it. And for those of you who know Cheltenham, this eventually morphed into the Whitbreads um, at the back of the town sort of thing where you had the car park. And usually on a typical on a Monday or Tuesday, if you wander through Cheltenham, you'd always smell the hops being brewed up. Builders, oh, you must have had hundreds of thousands of places needing the skills of the humble brickie. Um, this is a lovely photograph from the Citizen. It shows builders working on the Bledso wing, for the new physiotherapy ward at Lydney Hospital. Um, it was built opposite the main hospital, which you can see in the background there, in 1963. And it's still in use today as a physiotherapy ward. So obviously the builders did quite a good job. Um, a little thing, bus drivers, conductors. Um, this lovely picture shows um, the outside the Georgian and Winchcombe. It shows Trouton's omnibus, which ran between Cheltenham and Winchcombe. It was a Monday to Saturday service, left Winchcombe about 9.30 and departed from Cheltenham around about 4 p.m. We don't quite know how long it took, but it must have been quite a while because it doesn't look the most powerful bus. And it's, of course, it's got to get up Cleve Hill to get to, get to Ch Winchcombe on the return. This one here is much more interesting, I think. Um, it's the Great Western Railway's bus number 16. Um, it's a 20 horsepower Milnes Dame, the standard double deck 018 stroke 16 RO bus. That is a designation. And it was based at Stroud Station from January 1905. Um, as well as trains, the GWR ran quite an extensive network of road carriages, both for carriage of people and for goods. But what's interesting here is, is by this date, um, the actual Grimskin Chalford, which you can see written on the side of the buses, they had railway halts. So you're thinking, you know, what is this? How's this bus working? It's going from Stroud to Grimskin to Chalford and back again. Is it taking, dropping off at lots of stops on way and taking people to the halts or is it just people taking people to Stroud? And so we don't really know how this actually operated. Another interesting, you won't be able to see it on this photo, but when we've enlarged it, we've had a good look. And this bus has got the registration plate, um, Charlie October 84. And that actually indicates, we did some work on it, it's indicated it was it was actually registered at Exeter and not in Gloucestershire. So it was brought up from Exeter purposely to work in the Stroud area. Uh, Canary girls. Um, these were girls who worked in munitions factories, manufacturing trinitrotolerine, TNT, during the First World War. Um, this photograph, which comes to us from the Gloucestershire Family History Society, thank you very much, is thought to be Nellie Slater, uh, who worked there. Um, the nickname Canary Girls arose because exposure to TNT is not only toxic, but after a time, it could turn the skin to an orange-yellow plume, and it was thought to look like canaries. So that's how they got their nicknames. And locally, uh, women in Gloucester worked in the National Filling Factory Number no. 5 at Quedgley, which is a, a 300-acre large site that began production of shells in March 1917. At its peak, it employed roughly 6,300 people, of which 5,000 were women. So it, it was a, a phenomenal thing for women to get working in. Um, and it was so popular, so many people working there, that the Midland Railway actually built a branch line <coughs> excuse me, from the main line 
passing through Gloucester to the factory. And this is an example of one of the tickets there they were given. And they were given them at a discounted rate and they could only go there and back. But you had to be a worker there to get the discount. I love this Monty Python, Blessed Are the Cheesemakers. And this is a lovely photograph taken at Old Court Farm in Lower Stone around about 1973 um, by P. Turner. And it shows basically cheesemaking taking place. And you can see the lady there, the cheesemaker, is actually using what they call a curd breaker. It's to break up the sort of the curds that form. Um, in the background, you can just see a cheese press there with sort of the X on it. And there are some slightly some cheese molds as they were. Um, Traditionally, Gloucester cheeses were only made with the milk of Gloucester cattle. Um, and, you know, obviously we love our double Gloucester and are the rarest sort of single Gloucester. Um, and we'll be talking about that in our later presentation in a few months. So tune in if you want to hear about what the difference is and why they are so special. A chauffeurs. Um, this is all we know about this photo is it's Mr. Bolland, and we know it's a Straker Squire car around about 1907, taken somewhere around Stroud. We know nothing else about it, and we can't have to identify the car because we can't make out the license plate. But you know, it's a lovely looking car. You can see him there with his hat, and you think he looks a proper chauffeur. Here's a better one. Um, this is um the chauffeur of Mr. Charles Alfred Appley, who's a wealthy woolen manufacturer, Rodbra Court. It's taken in 1906 and the car is a 20 horsepower Coventry Climax um, registration AD234 when we've got the records of this we know it came into the county it was actually bought and sold about four or five times in its lifetime before we lose track of it Chauffeurs were typically quite well presented, clean cut, and they were usually in uniform, uh, as you can see here from the driver's caps and especially in the bottom photograph look at the classic driver's gauntlets they're wonderful aren't they and just as an aside, the term chauffeur comes from the French term for stoker. And the reason that this is because the earliest automobiles were steam powered. So they required the driver to stoke the engine and shovel, shovel coal in. So that's where it came. And it sort of stuck. Even the later sort of petrol and diesel cars required the fuel to be heated up. So then that's why the name actually stuck in with it. Um, coachman, uh, this is really interesting photo you have to say it was taken about in 1870 well into the twilight years of, of coach travel um but it shows a coach outside the white heart in in winchcombe and we think winchcombe was served later by coaches because the railways didn't get there till 1906 so there was still a demand for it even though you've got trains and bus which we saw earlier running and I sort of think this photograph is probably earlier than the date given but I, you know it's, it's hard to tell precisely um what is interesting is the passengers on the roof, they're known as outside passengers, and this was a cheaper way of travelling. It was much about a third of the price from sitting inside, but it did expose you to the full force of the weather. And it wasn't unheard of for passengers to sort of freeze to death in the winter in real bad weather. And the other thing was if you fell off, it was tough. You know, unless they noticed you'd fallen off, they wouldn't stop. And in this picture, you can see the driver in the middle at the front there has got blankets over and he's obviously sharing them with the lady to, to his left. And the other thing about stagecoaches, coaches, we have this idea that they were galloping through the landscapes at high speed. Well, they weren't really. They were doing five to eight miles an hour, sometimes 10 to 12 at the end of the period. And of course, they only travelled around about 60, 70 miles a day. So usually such journeys, long journeys, took four or five days to get anywhere. A coppicein, it's a traditional way of woodland manage management which relies on the ability of many trees to grow from the stump if they're cut down. So in a coppiced wood, which is where we get the name cops from, um, the young trees are repeatedly cut down to near ground level. And this allows new growth that after a number of years can be harvested. Um, and they provided what it did provide everything basically fence staves, poles, firewood, which is usually sold in bundles known as faggots, laths for wattland daub, they used the bare, the bare materials for hurdle making, for pegs, thatching spars, tool handles for making charcoal, brooms, and a hot pole. So it was a fantastic industry which was practiced everywhere. Um, it's this is a lovely example from the Batsford Estate account, 1770. It shows John Phillips there, you can see, being paid 10 shillings for half a day's coppicein. That's about five times than a, than a typical labourer. So it was you know, a well, a well interesting and well profitable sort of occupation. Um, and luckily, it's still being practised today. I do coppicein. I love it. It's great fun. 
Um, the biggest problem we have now with coppice is when we actually cut them down and the shoots start regrowing is the number of deer in the, in the countryside. They'll come and nibble all these shoots down to nothing. So nowadays you have to do a lot of protection around them. Sometimes you can put deer netting up to keep them. District nurse, um, this is a lovely photograph of Nurse Wolf in Godwinton around about 1895 in a donkey cart before she was going to start in her rounds. And we go, don't know much else about it, sadly, um, but there is a note on the back of the photograph states her salary was about £35 a year for, for this role. And I think you agree, it's a lovely photograph. It's a rather a pot bellied donkey, though, so maybe it could do with a bit of the exercise, I think. Um, dockers, um, Gloucester Docks built handled global maritime trade bound to and from the Midlands and also timber from the Balkley. They were nationally important. Um, and we've got a, love, some lovely photographs of docks. This is one, my special favourite one. It shows a Midland Railway horse team hauling what, if you can see on the right and left hand side there, quite a large wagon around about 1887. You can see Philpott's corn merchants in the background. Um, Although there were extensive rail setups around the dock, so you had the GWR and the Midland Railways coming in from both sides, inside that port, the corners were very sharp. So they relied on turntables to move wagons around the bends. And of course, steam engines couldn't do that. So that's why they all used horses. And there are still some rails down by the docks all there. Um, and, you know, and there's a steam crane there as well, I think. So you can see by the corner of the docks there, one of these remains of one of these turntables, which is, you know, it's really interesting how they worked. Of course, it wasn't just horses. They had men. Um, this is this is actually in Tewkesbury. So these are corn porters shifting sacks of corn, potentially corn or flour, from Healings and St Mill. Um, we're pretty sure it's at Tewkesbury, although the actual picture doesn't say. But if you look at the sacks, you can see Healing and Sons written on it. Um, their flour mill, which is now closed but still exists, was one of the largest and most advanced flour mills in the country, and it, it could produce 25 sacks of flour an hour, which was a phenomenal rate. And of course, that depended on getting corn in to do that. This is a real Gloucestershire occupation, Elverman. Um, so Elvis or glass eels, the young eels that traditionally caught and consumed in Gloucestershire is a rather cheap dish. They were fished for at night, on, 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 usually on spring tides, with a lamp to draw the Elvis actually into the Elver net. And this is two examples of the Elver net. They had this lovely, distinct trapezoidal shape. Um, and that's basically used so they could dip onto the riverbank, stay close to it, because the Elvis tended to stay on the edges and they would get caught. If they were traditionally sold by the pint and alive, and fried with bacon. Um, you know, that's a lovely picture of that's what they look like. Um, some people hated them, some people loved them. I remember the last ones I had from about 1978, although a few years ago, about 10 to be precise, the uh, flower shop on London Road, uh, word went round lost that they got elvers in, and it turned out to be Spanish elvers in a tin with olive oil and garlic. They were edible, but they were nowhere near as nice as normal elvers. Today, will you get normal elvers? No, you won't. Um, they are considered a real major delicacy. Current costs are around about £500 a pound, um, which is, you know, crazy money. But it's good reason for it because environmental changes and overfishing have reduced the eel population to a point where they're now critically endangered. Um, sadly, illegal elvering is still rife. It's very, you know, it can be very dodgy on the on the riverbanks around springtime. Um, and eel smugglers, especially the, the actual black market can earn millions of pounds and smuggling them in and out. Engine driver said at one point most boys wanted to be engine drivers when they grew up. It's a very nice little photo for the, the Gloucester Railway Carriage and Wagon Company's works locomotive, the 040 locomotive, the Siam, which was used for shunting in and around the wagon works and also for taking finished wagons if they were going to go out on the nail, main nail rail network, get my teeth back in. Um, they used to take it out to sidings where they could be collected. Very quite a small loco, you know, it still be, must be great fun. But does it compare to this one? This is a BR standard 2MT260. Look at the driver leaning out the window um, at a speed that you know, Siam's driver can only probably dream of. You can hear this train thundering over, over the canal bridge here. The canal bridge itself uh, is at Ryford. It's going over the Stridewater Canal. So the train's actually heading for Nailsworth. We know it was taken in 1965. Um, that line was closed in 1966. So you know this might have been one of the last trains going over it. And underneath the locomotive there, you can just make out there's a couple of people on the canal bank side there with a, it's a bicycle leaned up against the actual uh, brick retaining wall. Um, 
engineering machinists, a lovely photograph. This is Carlton Green. He worked in the light machine shop of Fielding and Palaps from 72 to 81. He'd been born in Jamaica in 36, came to the UK when he was 21, went and attended the Gloucester Tech College, and he became a skilled lathe operator at uh, TJ Daniels and Stroud. He then started working at Fielding and Platt, which were a, a massive, world, world famous company. And he started working on all types of special machinery. This photograph is taken from a company's promotion catalogue and shows him working on a Ward 7 capstan lathe, which is again a high special machine which you could set up, push a button, and it would start turning out exactly the same thing. And you can see Carlton here is using the bore gauge to measure exactly the inside of the, the, the cut he'd made on that tube. These gauges would be accurate to like a thousandth of an inch and then have to make that all the way up so you know we've got had so much engineering like this in Gloucestershire sadly most of it has gone now um, but it's just one of the things that the people use people for um, fairground workers, this is a little slide here. This is a, some children looking on as the Gloucester Park's annual fun fair takes shape. Back to 1960, we think. The men are working on the waltzer ride in the background. And you can see another ride to the left, and there's the big wheel in the background. Um, you know, this with the fair would come along, get set up, stay for a week, and then disappear. Still does today, although there's rather more noise and disco music than there was back then, I think. A uh, lovely picture. This is the village church fiddler, Johnny Hopkins of Salford, photograph, photographed around 1944. Um, could be earlier. We don't know, no, no. you know, this sort of thing was probably going on for years. And although churches were dominated by organ music, some often used fiddlers and other musicians. Um, you know, and so Johnny would have made his trade going around villages, playing in the churches. Um, this photograph comes from a magazine called Gloucester Countryside, which was uh, an earlier version of what is like Cotswold life today. Um, and again, if you want to look at these, we've got lots of them in the archives, along with Gloucester and Avon life, and they are full of lovely little snippets and photos, things just like this. And again, although Johnny's described as a church fiddler, it's probably more than certain he'd happily perform in other locations. And you can imagine him down the local pub on a Friday or Saturday night playing music for everybody. Fireman. Uh, it wasn't until late 1800s, early 1900s that municipal fire brigades began to become common. Um, and this is a lovely shot of the Minchinhampton fire engine taken and buried about 1900. Interesting, the town actually got its first fire engine in 1755 and it had a few fire houses that it built to house the engine. But the actual first official fire brigade was formed in 1864. So, you, you know, before that, it was whoever got to the engine first could man it and run it out. And then compare this one. This is Stroud Urban District Council's fire engine uh, taken in 1910. And this is a Merriweather and Sons horse-drawn double vertical boiler engine. Um, if there was a fire, they'd get to the fire station. The first thing they'd do is light the boiler. And the idea was by the time they got to the fire, the boiler would have reached enough temperature, got enough steam up to actually use the pump on it so they could spray water. The biggest problem with these is they didn't carry that much water. So they had lots of other houses to sort of suck water up from wherever they could find it, lakes and rivers, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And a lovely little nicety on this, this, this photograph. If you have a look at the chap on the left hand side, you can see there's a black X by his arm. And on the reverse of this photograph, it says, I've put a cross by the one I'm going to meet tonight. So obviously this is like a, a sister writing to her sister or friend saying, oh, she's going out on a date and that's the guy she's going out on a date with, which is fantastic. Sadly, we don't know the names of these people. Yeah, it'd be lovely to sort of find out what happened to them. Which is, did this date turn into something exciting or, or did it just fizzle out? Who knows? Up to your imagination. Fishermen, um, lots of different types of fishing carried out on the seven. I've already mentioned Elverman. Um, this is a lovely photograph of an eel fisherman with a fike or an eel basket uh, taken at Appley around about 1932. So quite late. Again, this is practice still being used. Um, this one shows four fishermen hauling in a seine net on the seven. Um, and it can be seen next to a seven punt. We can just make out on the bottom right hand side the bow. The seven punt was actually a, a purpose built belt and seven, and they didn't exist anywhere else. There are variations. And the seven one, there was a few survivors now, and the design was copied and went elsewhere. But basically, this would have been set. The actually, there's a man at the, at the far end, you can see him. He would hold the one end, and the, and the punt would go and take this net the other end of the other side of the river and then bring it back in. And then they'd haul in to see, see what they caught, which probably wasn't very much to be honest 
Pre-miners and the Forest of Dean. Mining's gone on since prehistoric times, but ochre, iron ore, and even coal being dug out. Um, it was all well established by the Roman occupation of the area. But we know that for sure. There's lots of evidence for it. Um, Edward I granted forest miners their free status, the free miner status, and it was a birthright available to any man or woman born within the hundred of St. Bravels who were aged 21 or over and had worked for a day in a year in a coal or iron mine and stone quarry. If they qualified on that, they could get and set themselves up as a free miner. To do this, they'd have to open a gale and they have to go to the forest gavala who is the officially represents the crown in the forest and apply for a license and again if you're interested in that this aspect of Gloucester history we have got lots of licenses for the free miners and the gales that they've done um, one of the big arguments in the forest is when they closed down the Sydney um, hospital birth unit because that meant that nobody would be they were killing off the free miners because there have been very few babies born in the forest and therefore you removed the right. I don't know how that's been resolved now, um, but you know the free miners are still going strong. There's still one or two pits working there. Um, Hopewell Corrie is one. And there's a couple around the back of there. So again, if you're walking in the forest, it's always worth look, having a look out for them. And you can often see the old gales as well. Usually they're sort of um, got gates on so you can't get down there. They're usually known as drift mines, um, and you can see from there the the forest coal is in actually quite a thin steam. It's about only a foot thick at the biggest. I think the coal for High Delf is about a foot. Um, so these weren't like massive, huge mines where people could walk in on their vehicles underneath. They were smaller ones, though there were a few big national pits where you could work them. Fancy is one, Trafalgar, Lightmore is another. So again, these are all still around in the industrial parts of the forest. A flyman. A uh, fly was a horse-drawn public passenger, pretty much like a handsome cab or a modern taxi. Um, and they're also licensed by local authorities in more or less the same way. Um, and this is, we've got several applications from this one from Cheltenham Borough Council for a chap called William Haynes. He's applying for a license to be a flyman who is the driver. So he could basically earn money to support his five children because their mother, his wife, had died previously and he needed to work. He needed to work. Interestingly, he'd got himself a fly cab to do this but within a year he'd sold it so the license was revoked and when we again suddenly it's one of the, the beauties and the annoyances of archives we don't know what happened to this man or you know what happened to the kids no doubt they'd be in the parish registers but it'd be interesting to find out Gardener, most of the big houses had large gardens and they grew lots of attention. So most people had gardeners. And this is the, the lawn at the old rectory at Cannonbourne near Western Sub Edge. And it's got a lovely gardener out there um, starting to mow the lawn. Mowing lawns was much, much easier when they introduced the lawn mowers. Prior to it, it was done by scythes, which would take a long time. Um, and this is a, this is what we've checked this with the old lawn mower club. Yes, there is such a thing. And this is a Ransom's 20 inch Mark II lawn mower powered by a Villiers Mark V 269 cc engine. It's quite a big engine for a little, little lawn mower. Um, but yeah, it's a lovely photograph and you can, yeah, it would have been painted green with red bits on it. It's got your ass pock. So, you know, it would have made this guy's job a whole lot easier. A jailer, um, so Gloucester had several jails around. Um, and this is an interesting pamphlet, it's quite old, 1792. And you know, we always have this idea of the jailers were vicious, nasty people. And you can see, you see him here. There's this guy on the left hand side, it's really sort of irate, doesn't he? You know, not very nice chap. And there's your, your poor in inverted commas, poor prisoner being he's gonna ball and chain is sort of clamped together he can't do much the interesting is look like a spinning wheel in the background and maybe sacks of wool there so he may have had to do some spinning work don't particularly know what this case was about um the boy was allegedly sentenced to seven years sorry confinement um i must one day get this out and have a read find out what he'd actually done a goat herd okay it's not as common as in austria but you know goat herd was once a role in gloucester's past and these are some photographs of goat keepers um they show a toggenberg on the left and anglin newbin on the right and we think they're probably taken prior to an agricultural show around about 1910 um we think the photographer is william moss who ran a photographic business in castle street Sarcester, around the turn of the century and we, we thankfully we have enough of his photographs um at other places as well so you know that's nice if you're interested in Sarcester, this is a collection well worth looking at Hangman, obviously there are hangman back there. Um, this is a gibbet. It's from an enclosure map. 
Don't ask me which one. Somebody told me, they gave me the photograph and they forgot to record the actual reference for it. And I've been at the archives now 21, 22 years. I've not found it yet. So I'm still looking. Um, so if you ever have to get an enclosure and a map out for any reason, please, please, if you see that, let me know. Um, basically, the gibbets, they were usually set up close to where the crime took place and the localities often become linked with them. Um, the Hangman Stone is a typical one that's on the way out on the A40 to the North Leach Road, just past what was the pub that was the pews down. Um, the gibbeting would be carried out by the Hangman assistants and the criminal's body was left to rot in this cage and thirds required again. The picture on the left is, on the right, sorry, is Captain Kidd, um, who was hung, executed at, and gibbeted at Deptford, hence the little seagull and the, and the boat sail in the background, so it's left to all the people to see. Um, they often became tourist attractions. You get people going out to look at them. And of course, when the body started to disintegrate, they'd be nicking bones and everything, you know, souvenirs or even for medical purposes. So you know, there's something glad that doesn't really happen anymore. Um, Harbour Master, um, this is the, the Harb Sharpness, Harbour Master and the family um, by their home, which is the building in the background on the quay at Sharpness. Um, Harbour Mas Harbour Masters enforced regulations of the port, they ensured safe navigation, security of the harbour, and also correct operation of the port, port facilities, and, and they charged people for this as well. They maintained navigational aids, inspected vessels, oversaw local pilotage services, which was quite important on the seven. Um, but they also had the legal power to detain, caution, and arrest people committing any offences in the port and that included people like jumping over the gates trying to nick things and everything in the background so into the building today it's the headquarters of the seven area rescue association the sara um, which have the base a couple of their boats here at, at sharpness hedger hedge lanes a lovely country craft we've practiced hundreds possibly thousands of years especially important after the enclosure acts began to divide up the countryside in the 1700s um and this little image is is from the state miranda book of james ag from his hewlett's estate and it refers to the hedges laid on the lug 1798 so it was going on then this chap also transplanted materials by the look of it and today hedgerows define our countryside were vitally important for wildlife as a refuge a source of food and as corridors from which they can move through the landscape um, it declined as a trade after World War II due to cost and labour, basically, and the introduction of those beastly hedge flail machines for cutting hedges or, or trashing them, basically. And also cheap wire fencing was made available. Thankfully, today, it's making a combat, a comeback, but it is quite expensive because it requires a skilled person, because whereas a tractor driver can do a field in about an hour, you know, take a hedge there several days. But, you know, in many respects, the hedges are much better. They're stock proof, whereas the new way of doing it doesn't make them stock proof. So it's quite important in that respect. Horse breeder, of course, with so many horses being used for agricultural work, horse breeding was a big business, and there are lots of farms around that did it. Um, this is a photograph of a rather nice stallion um, at the accurately named Stud Farm near Blazon around 1900. Um, probably a new purchase, I would think, and the owner is probably the chap on the left-hand side with the beard, um, you know, showing off his proud new acquaintance, hoping it's going to make the farm lots more money. Horsemen, um, as I mentioned earlier, if you're an agricultural labour, you had to work with horses. And this is a fantastic photograph of, of Ted Smith with two farm horses. Ted worked at Colomen Farm on Church Road in Lake Hampton in Cheltenham all his life. He retired in 1939 at the age of 80. Um, and this photo was taken to Marcus Diamond Red in 1941 when he went back to the farm to see the old horses he'd worked with. And it's a lovely photograph. You know, and this chap, you know, he looks like he's having the time of his life seeing his old friends again. Uh, lathe netting, this is another type of fishing. Um, it was a technique used to catch salmon and other fish in the lower parts of the S7 estuary. And basically, fishermen would venture out with a, with a lathe net and they would dip this uh, into channels on the ebb tide and hope that salmon would, would get washed into it. Um, it required a massive amount of local knowledge, you know, because you don't want to go out there on the estuary at all if you don't know it, because it's so easy to die, basically. Um, today, there's only one group still alive, the Black Rock Lathe Netters. And if you like Facebook, go on to them, look at that word, and you'll see some great images of them. They've been banned from actually lathe net fishing by the Environment Agency 
partly because they think they're going to take too many salmon. Well, they typically talk caught about one or two salmon a year. Sadly, most of the salmon are being mopped up in, in lower estuary and in the sea by factory fishing. So, you know, it's a bit of a shame that they're not letting this technique still be practiced. The last time I saw it was about eight years ago. I spotted a group of people. Literally, I thought they were in the middle of a sandbank off Lydney. And I thought, you know, what the hell are they doing out there? And then I realised one put the net up and I realised what they were doing. The fantastic tiny and it's not really found anywhere else other than in Gloucestershire. I throw in little crossing keepers. Crossing keepers were railway staff looked after railway crossings. And this is a wonderful shot of the Barton Gates at Gloucester. Not there now, but I'm sure some of us might remember them being closed. Um, the line led out from the Gloucester Eastgate station, which is under Asda now, essentially. And it went on down out towards through Tuffley. It doesn't exist now. It's been totally built over. It was closed in 75, I think the station was. Um, and it just serves as an either way through Gloucester for southbound trains, basically, whereas today they go into Gloucester Central and they have to reverse out. Back then, they could actually go into Gloucester Eastgate and go on through. Um, basically, the uh, crossing keepers had to look after. They controlled the movement of the gates. Uh, they could open the gates. They had locks on. We'll look at one of those in a minute. And they basically maintained them, maintained them as well. So they had to look after them. Usually, if they were out in the country, they had a little box they could go into and wait for the next train, which was signaled by a bell. And they could just nip out and close the gates. Um, obviously, most of them are now replaced by automated gates and barriers in the 70s. And obviously, this particular gate has actually gone completely. However, uh, although most have been replaced, not all of them replaced. And this is this is the St Mary's Crossing at Brinscombe in the Golden Valley line. It's still manually operated. It's a GWR style and uses what they call an interlock that so only releases the keys to open the gates when there isn't a train coming. Otherwise, the keys are held and locked in a white box at the foot of the keeper's cabin. And again, the keeper's cabin is the building you can see just in front of the gates on the left hand side there. Um, uh, again, a bell rings, the guy goes out. The box opens, you can get the keys out. And they're big brass keys, about sort of you know 10 or 12 inches in size with special sort of cuttings on the end, and he puts them in and can close it. And of course, if you go into London on the train from Cheltenham or Gloucester, you go past this one, so keep your eyes out. Usually it's just a flash and it's gone, but it's it's really nice to see it work. I don't think there are any plans to change it. They're quite happy to keep this as a manual crossing. Milkmaids, um, also known as dairy maids, high demand in the Vale of Gloucester, where they're responsible for milk and cows, making cheese and dairy project before agriculture became really industrialised. Um, the skills and knowledge that they had, it passed down through generations of women who would often develop their own closely guarded family secret recipes and their techniques for making cheeses and creams and things. And interesting, the word dairy actually derives from the old English word for female servant. But in reality, these women were often the sole economic drivers for the farms being profitable and being allowed to sustain. So that what they made, you know, made a lot more than what the actual male farmer himself could sell. So more than turnips, more than wheat. It was the cheese and the cream that was so valuable. And this photograph, I love this photograph. It, it looks like a posed shot, to be honest. There's no grub for the cow, for starters. And uh, we think it was taken around Stinbridge, Howell, Pirtle, Glossington, somewhere around about in the early 1900s. And you can see the milkmaid here has got a little metal bucket between her feet to catch the milk. Um, interestingly, although the Vale was dominated by Gloucester cattle, which is black with a stripe down, white stripe down the back, this one is a Rowan Shorthorn, which is a breed originated in the northeast of England, 1700s. So, you know, it's, it's quite an unusual beastie for me down here. You know, and it looks a bit thin on the ground there to me. It's, you can see it's ribs. You don't really want to see ribs on a cow, milk and cow like that. But it could be the start or the end of the season, perhaps. Mobile catering, you know, not something we associate with the past, but though most ladies have them today in lots of types, um, this is a lovely image of a horse-drawn fish and chip van in the Sarancest area. We think it's at the local carnival, so you can see make out like a, a health sculpture in the background. Um, we know very little about it, but it's obviously working. So if you look on the top right, you can see white smoke coming out of the out of the chimney. Um, so obviously cooking is underway, and you see hot fish and chips. And it actually says hot fish and chip potatoes there. And we also know chips and potatoes, but back then it was probably quite new. Um, most fans like these actually used coal-fired ranges, but this is before gas was available. And um, the main drawback was to these was they took quite a while to heat up. 
So you'd have to light the fire, get it really up to temperature. And then you had to maintain that fire all the time to get to the correct temperature. And so assuming, I'm assuming there's another boy or a man kicking around here whose job that was while the actual the chef actually did the cooking and the handing out. But I'm sure we all have fish and chips. And, you know, you can imagine it must be really tasty from one of these, I think. Mole catching. You know, moles have always been considered nuisance to lawns, fields or gardens, and they can trip up racehorses and cattle, um, and also mole tun tunnelling can damage crops, and allegedly stones thrown up by moles can damage farm machinery. I've got nothing against moles, I love the little beasties, to be honest. Um, but mole catching was a very lucrative business, and again, this is another one from the Batsford Estate account, 1770, which shows the mole catcher Edward Grimmett receiving three shillings for half a day's work. When you consider the average labourer's daily pay was a shilling, three shillings was, was good money. Um, they used to catch them by digging holes and putting clay or wooden pots in them with water so the mole would come in, its tunnel falling and drown. Um, but by the 1700s, steel plunger traps, which basically the mole would trigger a steel knife that went through it. Scissor traps, which you can still buy today, which is like a pair of scissors that close on the mole and crush it to death along with spring caps and even mole guns. There was a mole gun. It was basically a gun, short barrel, put in the road with a plate on it. The mole would come along, hit the plate, and it would pull the trigger and blow the mole's head off, basically. Um, later, you got chemicals coming into it, so they would dip worms in strychnine and put them in. Um, but this, they realised it was so poisonous. And also the moles couldn't, the mole men couldn't show their catch the traditional way, which was hanging the dead moles on a fence. And I remember going up to a friend who lived at Salperton only in the 1990s, 1980s, 1990s, and seen a fence with about 40 or 50 moles hanging off it. So it's the mole catcher's sort of prize and joy. The shooters, however, they had a much better way of doing it. They used explosives. They would actually take an empty hazelnut, fill it with gunpowder, put a fuse in, find the mole's rug, which you couldn't do quite easily, and they would push it into the tunnel, light the fuse and step back. And the idea presumably was, if you were lucky enough, it might blow up the mole, but the idea was the noise would scare the mole away. Um, that's a fantastic one, but how effective it was, probably not very. Musicians, this is the Mick Collins band from 1962, the semi-professional beatnik band, band on Gloucester's, which they're very lively music scene. Um, they wore the same sort of outfits as they did back then. Four band members. Uh, the drummer was the actual guy who, who sort of sorted the band out and made it. At the back there, second from the left, you can see Hugh Nurse Worsnip, who was a TV presenter and a journalist, obviously in a much younger time than he is now. Navvies, coined in the late 1700s when the canals they were building was known as navigations and then the name became linked with them. Later, this was actually stuck with those building the railway network. And despite we got this idea of navvies all being Irish, only about 30% were, the majority were English. Work long, hard and dangerous. And we've got this lovely extract from the Church and Burial Register in 1849 recounting the burial of a young navvy. Um, and you see it there, a, lay, a, na a lad name unknown in the churchyard near the first yew tree, southeast corner of the churchyard, killed in the Highland Cutting or Downs Bridge. Um, the burial took place on Sunday evening when about 100 of his mates attended the funeral, uh, dressed in white slops and trousers and the 12 bearers wore each little white rose on his left breast and the rest came two and two. It's a beautiful sight. So, you know, this young lad at the bottom, his name was unknown. He thought to be about 15, where his birthplace was unknown. But, you know, he obviously made an impression on his workmates who did this funeral for him. However, in Shift Earth, they built other things. This is a fantastic photograph showing the building of the Kappa Mill Viaduct, which carries the GWR's line over the valley into Stroud from the west. Built in 1868 to replace timber viaducts, a timber viaduct, um, 22 spans, and it, it looks huge even um, today, but at the time, today, sorry, the land has been built up around it, so it must have looked even bigger when it's first built. And look at this, look at this, no safety equipment there. They're just on scaffoldings walking around. You know, how they didn't all die, I don't know, but wonderful, wonderful photograph. 
police officers. Um, Gloucester's got sort of, we think it actually is the first oldest constabulary outside London now. Um, with this show, Sergeant William Morris. Now, he died on 10th of November 1895 when he and PC Cornelius, who isn't one of the guys on the other picture, got in a fight with a party of drunken forest miners. Um, they were struck down by stones, and although Harding regained consciousness and went for full recovery, poor Sergeant Morris died, sustained a fractured skull and a broken neck. Uh, and three colliers, colliers were later arrested and convicted of manslaughter. Morris was 32 years old, been a sergeant, a surgeon for 10 years, left a widow and three children. There are funds set up to, to help them afterwards. Um, in the 194 years of Gloucester Constabulary, 20 police officers died while on duty. So it's again sobering thought that, you know, although it's fairly safe, it's not always safe. Posty, this is a posty delivering mail in the Strand area. What's most interesting about this? Have a look at the medals on the recipient's chest. So this is probably a pose photo, I think. Um, you know, we don't know what the occasion is. We just know it's around 1900. You know, the medals, what are they from? Are they from Boa War, maybe Zulu War? We just don't know. Royal Mail began in 1516. Henry VIII established a master of the posts to carry oral communications. It continued like that until 1635 when Charles I made it available to the public. And for many years, the postage was paid by the recipient, not the sender. Um, the restoration renamed the General Post Office under the Postmaster General, and it became known as Royal Mail because it used the same basic distribution system that the government did. Um, I'm sure, remember, it renamed GPO 1969 when it was denationalised, that's transferred to the post office and it's now changed to a government department of state from department of state to Stafford Corporation. And of course, it's been bits of it have been sold off all over the place now. Poultry keeper. Chicken and ducks are the most common form of poultry, but the market for geese and turkeys. Um, this is a lady feeding turkeys in the farmyard of Charonworth Chase Farm. Um, between 1903 and 1932, we can't narrow it down any more than that. There is a motorbike there, um, but it's not Gloucestershire plate, so we can't identify it very easily. Um, the geese and turkeys were raised at the Christmas market. And judging by the straw rick in the background, the size of the birds and the leaf and the tree, this is probably taken around September or October, we think. Quarrymen, um, quarries in every part of Gloucestershire, Forest Vale and High Blue Hill. Um, often they're a small affair, simply dug out by one or two men just to build a local building or barn or something like that. Today they're visible as glassed over hummocks or hollows in the fields. There were a number of large, more commercial ones though. And this is thought to be a quarry near Minchampton, again, taken around about 1900 with the men working the great oolite limestones. Although, to be honest, those don't look really like some of the limestones that I know. So you know, I've got a feeling this might be a stray from somewhere else. Railway porter. This is George Harris looking rather dapper. A great Western railway porter. We don't think that's his uniform. It comes from the, one of the brilliant albums, a photograph taken by Edward Blackwell of Amberley, who was a buff and took lots of images of people, visitors in the church in the 60s and 70s at Amberley. Um, we know by this time George actually living in Cheltenham. He'd been born in Amberley, though, and we think this, this occasion was on the baptism of his son, which was performed by Reverend Blackwell and took place in 1865. So it seems to fit it more, 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 more better, I think, than him just coming over for the day. Shepherds, Cotswolds have always been associated with sheep since Roman times. You've got a sheep named after them. Although it used to be thought the name sheep, Cotswold, meant sheep pen. You don't think it does anymore. It means it's a personal name. Um, but there are sheep gargles, grotesques in Bybury and Compton Abdale. And of course, the money from sheep and the wool left us the legacy of often fabulous wool churches, again, which are always worth looking around. Where you got sheep, you got shearing. Um, this is lovely from from the nineteen twenties of two sisters, the Excel six sisters. She had three hundred and eighty eight sheep in one day, apparently at Heathfield Farm near Wick. This is from the Cheltenham Chronicle and Graphic. Um, the old hand operated crank there. Um, you know, you still do find a few of those around. And I, it doesn't really fit in the A to Z, but it's forest ship badgers. Um, tradition of running sheep for the forest dates back to twelve seventeen. Um, it's forest sheep, what they call haunted. It doesn't mean they're ghosts or they look like it sometimes at night. Um, it means they're settled with a certain area or heft, uh, and they allegedly rarely stray, but some do have a little polish on for roads, especially when a car comes along, town centres and gardens. And if somebody's lived in the forest and lost the whole crop of artichokes to sheep, I can argue with that for full. But the sheep are supposed to be hefted. They stay in their area, which means the commoners who can graze them don't need fencing, allegedly. And the idea of keeping the sheep there is lambs learn from the mothers, therefore they 
they don't stray either. But, you know, but it's still a lovely tradition in the forest. Um, you know, will it continue when the last forester dies out because they're not being born there? We don't know. Thora, um, again, important role. And this is a lovely set of records from Mitchell Dean, the Festry Parish, Festry Minutes. Um, again, lots of references to Sora's being paid to cut and timber. And you see this one in John Collins. Um, he's mentioned here several times, actually, for soaring. The one is the best one you can see is about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about 10 lines up. Pay John Coleman for soaring deals. Uh, it's John Collins there. There is another John Collins as well, Coleman. But again, goes on all the time. You needed these people to soar. It's a specialist occupation. Shopkeepers, every village and Hamlidge had their own shopkeeper. Towns, obviously, more. This lovely photograph here of Wilkins, bakers, and grocers at Borton on the water with the sons of one of the owners standing in, in the shop door. Um, this is the picture of one front of one of the Gloucester co ops. The co ops began forming around about 1844 and they developed over the years with merger of what they called wholesale societies, independent retailers. The idea was to offer cheaper food to poorer workers who if you became a member you'd also get a share of the profits a wonderful scheme and they're still going today um, the Gloucester Cooperative Society was the first one locally formed in 1861 followed by Cain's Cross 1868 Stride in 86 Cinderford in 1889 Lydney in 87 and you can look at that with Stride and Cain's Cross you've got the weaving industry and in Cinderford you've got the forest workers and the miners so this is where you really did need the cheaper food I love this photograph. This is the steeplejack. Uh, it shows removal of the top of St John's Spire in 1910, which had been damaged by lightning. Um, and again, the work and repairs we know were carried out by W. Larkin's local steeplejack. But again, look at that. There's hardly, there's no health and safety going on there. They got a ladder going up the side. You know, that must have been horrific to do. But this is Fred Dibner at heart, you know, so it's great. And obviously, you can still see the top of the, the spire uh, and near St Lucy's Gardens on the Via Sacra to the cathedral. Surveyor, um, this is only a photocopy we've got sadly, but it's a lovely one. It's a self portrait of a surveyor called Stephen Jeffries, who lived in Minchin Hampton, age 68. And they used these things called theodolites. This is quite, he must have been quite a good surveyor because these were quite expensive. And they would take all sorts of measurements. And you can see on the example on the right hand side, this is the sort of thing they did. They laid a straight line or a data line across the field and took lots of angles up and down to work it out, put it in a book. When they got back, they could actually do the draw the map. Um, this picture comes to us from Luton and Bedfordshire Archive Service, and it shows the surveyor actually starting to lay out the survey. Um, the guy on the left hand side is a shepherd. He looks like he's got a smile on his face. Little did he know he's going to be sort of enclosed at some point. Um, and they're setting up lines to make the data line, which they can take angles off. So again, lovely little picture. Thatcher. Thatcher was more common in the Vale because in the Pots of Dean there's always stone slates for roofing, but in the Vale there's lots more reed and straw you could supply. Um, this photo shows Frampton on Seven's Tithe Barn. It's in the first stage of thatching, so it's removing the old thatch. And you can see that a pile of old thatch that they've got to get rid of, probably then by burning, I would think. I love this picture. This picture is from a cottage on Sanagar Lane at Sharpness. And it, you know, it could clearly do with being refactored. There's so much greenery growing in through that. It's, you know, it's ridiculous. This is one of the problems of thatching. Um, you could, after a while, you would get things growing on it, and it didn't always work, help help the actual thatch. Water carrier. Um, this photograph comes from 1900 on Oldsworth, shows local local water carrier. We tend to forget that piped water was quite rare in rural communities and collecting it was a continual annoying chore. Um, most villages had a village pump and this is the pump at Oldsworth and thanks to the www.villagepumps.co.org.uk for letting me use this. This is a pump at Aldwich. Uh, Aldworth. It's about half a mile away, a quarter of a mile away from this cottage. It's right on the other side of the village, so it's not always convenient. So although most houses, some houses are private wells, these are often dry up in summer, or you could have springs or you collected rainwater, there was always a need for potable water. And usually local blacksmiths or shop Keepers would actually undertake this. They have a barrel, you go around and you get your water for the week or for the day, which you only use for drinking or cooking. Waterman. Um, Watermen have been working Gloucester's rivers probably since Roman times. This is just two quick examples. A private unladen coal barge on the Stradwater Canal heading down towards um, Salt there. And this is that place called the Ocean. You can see the railway in the background. And uh, again, the bottom one is one of um, John Harker's tanker barges on the canal by Monk Meadow, the Winnie H. They would be carrying fuel up from uh, Gloucester at Monk Meadow right up to Worcester and beyond. 
a tram driver. This is really unusual, but it shows the tram driver really well. Um, this is at the top of Wooden Pitching Gloucester, and it's a tram that was used to carry construction materials to Brockworth Aerodrome uh, in World War I. Um, they were nicknamed Black Mariahs. We think there was one. There might have been two. Um, basically, because his windows have been covered over, and this, the frame on the side is part of the materials, part of the framework for them, one of the hangars. And behind it, there's a, about three or four trucks, you can, wagons you can see. In the main picture, they're very tatty and they look broken. But that actually laid a track out from Huckercock to Brockworth. And it lasted for three years till after the war that it was completely lifted. And very little information is known about them, sadly. Travelling showman links in with the fairground workers earlier. Um, this is the Duchess of Worcester traction engine at the Witchcombe Mop around about 1901. And Mr. Peters is, we think he's the guy in the front. He might not be, we're not quite sure. But the Duchess herself was a Charles Burrell son, showman road locomotive, the number 2351. She doesn't survive, but two, sorry, 2350, but 2351 does survive and she's often seen at shows. And they use these basically to drag the basic fair ride, fair rides around the country. They also usually had big alternators, the dynamos in the front. You can see it just above the front wheels there, which would power the ride. And this this traction engine powered F. Peters and Sons galloping horses. So again, there's lots of photos like these. And again, if you're lucky enough to go to steam fairs, you can still see them today. And they're wonderful things to listen to and watch. Getting towards the end now, it's a slightly different role. This is a lovely map we have of Shipton Olive and Shipton Solids, which is up by Andover, some of the way to North Leach. And it's a highway, I think, on the A40, basically. Um, the map's great. It shows lots of local people, shows lots of traffic on the road. And, and to the right, where this horse is galloping to, is a big posh coach. And we know there are highwaymen active here. And I think this is a drawing of the art the cartographers. Done. Well, actually, we get highwaymen here, so he's drawn a picture of him. You know, the horse looks galloping. He looks like the highwayman might have a girl on him. The actual thing is it looks like a whip by the horse's tail is a crease in the paper but you never know it could be a hyman green cross code man you all remember dave price actor and green cross code man he visited modern school um the green cross code was a safety campaign from 71 to 90 it followed on from the tufty club i still have my tufty club badge um and of course we all know what is he famous for he's famous for being star wars although sadly his west country accent was quite strong which is why they dubbed it completely with jones all jones but he was a nice man and he often came around doing school trips and for the green cross code and lastly crash test dummy we know absolutely nothing about this photo other than we think it came from Citizen in 1976. I've looked for it. I can't find it. So I think the edition of the new paper we have, it was in a different edition. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's showing the effects of seatbelts and how safe they are. Although if you ask me, that guy looks like he's in quite a bit of pain. You would probably be more pain if you'd been in a car. So that comes to the end of the talk. I hope you liked it. I'll sprint for the last bit. Um, just to let you know that our next event at the Heritage Hub is on Saturday, 3rd of June. It's Do You Want a Career or Role in Heritage? And it's an event all about career volunteer roles in heritage. We've got representatives from archives, libraries, archaeology, museums, and lots of other heritage organisations, railways, etc., and air museums. Um, we'll have some speakers. Uh, the keynote speaker is Nick Barrett, who's famous for historian being on the BBC, Who Do You Think You Are? Um, sadly, he's probably not going to be able to be on site because the train one of the train strikes but he will be there sort of virtually over zoom i think it is um but there also be lots of other things have a go opportunities you can just chat to people you know if you fancy doing some volunteering it's going to be a great place to come and ask um we are asking you to book for talks for the talks so if you book via the heritage hub events it'll be fine and then just finally to finish our next secret reveal on my talk will be wednesday 20th of june Final secrets revealed online, beautiful minds. And it's look about the sort of how the history of mental health, mental health institutes in Gloucestershire from the records we hold at the archives. So it should be quite interesting. Um, but once again, thank you very much for listening and I'll hand back to Gemma for any questions. Hi, thank you so much, John. That was, I think we can all agree, was absolutely fascinating. Um, we've had a couple of comments from people just to say um, thank you very much for uh, the talk and really enjoyed it. Um, and from Sue saying that she went to Tuffy, uh, Tuffy Club at uh, St. Bridge, Clarence Square. Um, has anybody else got any questions that they would like to ask? I've set up on your voice by now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just give people a few seconds just in case they want to type anything into chat. 
Yes, we had another thank you as well. A couple more thank yous just to say um, that it was really interesting. Love the photographs. Thank you. Another super talk. Um, uh, um, also remember going to uh, Tufty Club in the 1970s. Um, so thank you very much. Um, OK, if nobody else has got any questions, um, we'll say thank you very much um, and goodbye. Um, thank you to John for giving such a, a wonderful talk. Um, uh, thank you to you all for attending and um, we hope to see you next month. Thank you very much. Before we actually sign off, that's what I should say. This a compressed version of this talk will go up on as an exhibition as usual. OK, so you can be a, it'll be a few, couple of weeks, but it will be up. OK, brilliant.